I'm very lucky that tonight's recipient uh, became my friend about 20 years or so ago when we first began working together. With the significant career that uh, we're honouring tonight, or dishonouring as the case may be, um, is really a career that's my entire life long. I was born in 1972, I'm about 15 years this guy's junior. Let me, one of the things that I think is the, uh, one of the things I love most about this Australian is he's certainly a wordsmith. Words, their meaning and the right choice of them play a huge part in every single thing this guy does, thinks and behaves. Um, so hopefully my choices tonight don't let my mate down. But, uh, I, and I'll reflect on some words from time to time as we go. From early in this guy's life, uh, as it continues today, uh, the career of the, the career is bulging with examples of um, his ability to constantly innovate and disrupt. Going back to early school life, you may be surprised to learn that this studious individual was Tony Abbott's, dare I say it, captain of the debating team. Words. When I was four. This person with school friend, Joylene Thornbird Hairmouth, a transvestite, formed a band. Not just any band, but the most popular live act of the time. But I don't think it was all rosy. There's a story I've heard once or twice, my dear, um, about the band's gear being rolled into a, the office stairwell and a chainsaw being taken to the desk of a Victorian music promoter who could well be in the room tonight. Um, over a pay dispute. <laughs> anyway, by 1981, this band had a top 10 single um, with They Won't Let My Girlfriend Talk To Me, which was written by Tim Finn from Split Ends. Um, not, too long, uh, not too long after that, Jimmy and the Boys disbanded. Um, some of the words that we used to describe my friend from this time, contortionist, singer-songwriter, shock rocker, punk, new wave. Today those words are innovation and disruption. Aside from stories of hanging upside down, naked, clad in nothing but fresh meat, as part of the act, for one reason or another we regularly revisit the story of the first Mardi Gras in 1978. This person was in the cross that night, being arrested for swearing at the top of his lungs from the, sta from the stage during one of Jimmy and the Boys performances. Chris Kennedy, you might, might have been there, I don't know. Um, I think the word was the safer C word. <laughs> but he, he, was, he ended up arrested and later in the cells with the 78ers. By the mid 80s, with a debut solo single under his belt, Like a Ghost, which was written by Steve Kilby from the church, or in partnership with, rhythm had become this guy's business. And one of Australia's entertainment showbiz industry sibling duos had formed when this guy formed another band with his sister Monica. And by this time, I'm old enough to be exploring music, and yes, in my music collection, I found a copy of their debut self-titled album, Pardon Me Boys. But Antonio, I think uh, the uh, tenors undercover is his next uh, career choice. He was enjoying you so much. There are many anecdotes from the time being Freddie Mercury's minder, and you could ask him yourself about crustaceans with Michael Hutchins. Many ta tales from the Siebel townhouse as well. Another band, arms and legs later, and tonight's recipient, my friend, was yet again transforming. Journalism, a career in journalism, more words. The grammar Nazi said in, if it wasn't already there, it still is here today. Don't ever dare use an M dash where an N dash would be better, let alone if a hyphen is required. In today's terms, uh, a quick Google search says this, journalism, RAN, Rock Australia magazine, The Edge, Stiletto magazine. But my favourite, this gay man was the editor of a straight magazine with tits and boobs and he concocted the idea of taking a photo in the world's largest bed in a brothel called the Nevada on Bayswater Road in King's Cross. It's now called the World Bar. Television. Journalism took him into television, culture, uh, culture shock for SBS TV, reporting on youth affairs of the day, acting in, a, in, a, in an 80s classic, Sweet and Sour. That led to a telefilm, The Lizard King. Now that's written by a great Australian playwright, Louis Nauer. This guy goes deep into every part of the Australian industry, whether it's an event or the arts. 
um, film, Those Dear Departed, in 1987 with Gary MacDonald and Pamela Stevenson, a camp comedy in 1988 alongside David Argue called Pandemonium, which we celebrated this year again. These two guys came back together. The voice of this friend of mine is the voice of yesterday's hero and Rumba de Burros from Baz Luhrmann's soundtrack for Strictly Ballroom. His publications in writing include True Hip in 1990 and the 1992 True Hip Manual. If this isn't a career that hasn't already taken off by 1992, when I'm in my second year at NIDA, the latter part of the career certainly does. Work with his sister, Monica, continues to grow, and there are numerous ex examples of the collaboration together, and they still continue today, even last night. Um, but major events become this guy's bread and butter, writing, directing, co-directing, collaborating in major events across the world. I've been lucky enough to work on a few of them. In 97, 98, I think, on Sydney New Year's Eve, where he created three or four years of fireworks, including the Millennium Celebrations on Sydney Harbour, the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games, a Je the Jeddah Economic Forum in Saudi Arabia in 2005, the opening ceremony of the Asian Games in Doha 2006, are just the, just the ones that I've worked on. There are so many more, but first, this significant Australian is deeply passionate about his Spanish and Filipino heritage, is quintessentially Australian, significantly Sydney, and ubiquitous in our event industry. Cultural heritage. Who else can best be described as having directed the opening night of a country? This guy directed the independent celebrations for East Timor on May 20, 2002, the raising of the red, yellow, black and white flags of an independent East Timor took place in the presence of Kofi Annan, Bill Clinton and, of course, Janana Gujma. Beyond that, the 2002 Gay Games, collaborations with the Shanghai 2010 World Expo, Vancouver 2010 Olympic Winter Games opening ceremonies. He even directed horses for Dolly Parton at Dolly World. The list continues. I'm wrapping up. Synonymous with this guy is the first horse sequence of the Sydney 2000 opening ceremony and later an arena spectacular for the, uh, the arena spectacular version of the man from snowy river words i'm going to borrow steal or paraphrase and i'm going to get in trouble but in sydney 2000 that horse and rider honored the stripling on a small and weedy beast from banjo patterson's famous poem if i follow the theme in honoring my friend colleague and tonight's recipient, I'd say he is, is the hardy mountain pony of Patterson's poem. He is hard and tough and wiry, but he's just the sort who won't say die. And his pluck is always undaunted, and his courage is fiery hot. Working to create or realise creative ideas with this significant Australian can often be like wheeling a mob of wild bush horses down a mountainside for one prized colt. But just when you think you may bid the mob good day, you let this guy have his head, and just like the man from Snowy River, you landed safe and sound. That happens daily in my working life at Vivid Sydney. Early on, he went by John. The people closest to him call him Nutch, or Nacho. If you've worked with him, you probably call him Ig or Iggy. But really, he is Juan Ignacio Trapaga. Ladies and gentlemen, Ignatius Jones. gentlemen thank you really thank you um, you know the worst thing about this award is it takes you a bloody lifetime to achieve it <laughs> I only wish I'd received it when I was 20 I am 20 
I got a lifetime achievement of what. Seriously, though, I feel like I do have half of my lifetime here in this room. I've been working with all of you for so long, and I think we've been having a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. You've been great. Um, you know, when you get one of these things, you're meant to say thank you to a lot of different people, and I'd just like to say thank you to some of the people who can't be here. I'd like to start with Rick Birch. Rick got me into events, and in a really particularly bizarre way, he was a big part of the committee to get us the uh, 2000 Olympics. So, uh, unlike you know most of the process with Olympic ceremonies, he had he had the gig from the beginning, and he was returning to Australia, and he thought, I'm going to return to Australia. I'm going to start. I'm, I'm going to reestablish my event company, Spectac. Leo Schofield once said more tack than spec, but we won't listen to that. Um, and when he got to Australia, he needed an artistic director for his company, and he called Baz Lerman and said, Baz, would you like to be the artistic director of my company? Now, this is just two fabulous ladies and gentlemen. Baz said, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually uh, doing this movie, Romeo and Juliet, remember them? And uh, Rick kind of said, well, can you help me? Who would you suggest? And Rick's first gig was doing the opening of the Crown Casino. He wanted to do a $2 million variety show. And the minute Baz heard that, Baz went, oh, vaudeville, get Iggy. You know, I'm, I was frankly very happy. Um, anyway, Vaudeville Iggy was now working with Rick Birch. Um, and in that position, I was an integral part of the 2000 Olympic ceremonies and I had a wonderful, wonderful moment with Rick. I mean, Rick, you can say a lot of things about him and against him, whatever. He's really good at choosing a team really good at choosing a team and then having lunch for about six months. Um, I say this in the nicest way possible, ladies and gentlemen, with great respect. Um, right at the beginning of our planning for the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games, we of course knew that we were going to open it with horses. Um, and, you know, early meetings, our indigenous artistic directors kind of went, horses? You can't do horses. Horses destroyed Australia. They stepped all over it. And it was like, um, hello, this is Australia. We don't have many epic poems or national heroes. This is the man from goddamn Snowy River. You know, this is the lone horseman. It's not the lone rabbit. Rick pushed me through that one and helped me. It was a little bit different when we were doing Millennium, and I wanted to put Eternity on the Harbour Bridge. And Rick said, Eternity? No one will remember it. Thankfully, Frank Sarter, the loud mayor, remembered it, and, you know, we got it across. Um, I can't go much further without thanking my ex-husband, David Atkins. I... I don't know if he's here tonight. Um, I hope he is. Uh, we spent eight, re eight years uh, showing the world that Australians put on the world's best events. No question. 
Sydney 2000 was the last time that a country did their own Olympic ceremonies. The last time, because after that, they brought in the Aussies, and they still do. Um, I'm in a very enviable position. I, I came back from, gosh, in, in a quick hurry, I had done the independent ceremonies of East Timor, the Sydney Gay Games, the 2006 Asian Games in Doha, and the um, Winter Games in Vancouver, which was a little bit like out of the frying pan into the freezer, and then straight into Shanghai and then back to Australia where I was just coming home to get a bit of a grease and oil change. And I was, I was instantly in vivid and in Mardi Gras uh, again. You know, what, what fabulous opportunities to, good, to do good work. And one of the big things for me in terms of saying the phrase good work is bringing new people, young people, different people, women, gay people, into the events industry. We don't move forward, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to die. You know, Australia's events industry now rules the world's event industry because we are so good at it. Yes, we are so good at it. And why? Because we don't accept no for an answer ever. We will make it work. When Australians are faced with some of the issues that face Americans and English members of our industry, they go, oh yeah, let's fix it. Whereas, you know, uh, in the West End and on Broadway, I have seen people go, not my union. And, you know, uh, oh no, I sing, I don't dance. I act, I don't sing or dance. Hello. For Australians, we do it all, and we do it really, really well. I've got a few other people to thank. Um, I've been very, very lucky. I came back to Australia to a thing called the Vivid Festival. Um, Yes, thank you. You can. Uh, it was in its second year. I came just after its second year finished, and it didn't really know where it was going, and I was asked to give it a, an identity and a path forward. And if it hadn't been for, and yes, I'm going to thank my boss, because if... I didn't, it would be neo-suicidal, uh, but no, I have to thank, I have to thank Sandra Chipchase. What can I say about a CEO and an executive producer who has never looked at me and said, that is absolutely batshit crazy even though it was. And we have gone from a little festival of 200,000 attendees to 2.33 million. That could not have been done without Sandra. You know, you don't expect bureaucrats. And I say that in the nicest possible way, Sandra, don't kill me. Don't. You don't expect them to be smart, tolerant, 
accepting, and above all, creative. And she has been that, and she has stood up for us. And as I said, when I have come and when Adam, thank God for Adam, <laughs> when we've come up and said, why don't we do this, Sandra? She has not said, you're absolutely batshit crazy. And many times we were. Um, but it's worked, and we now have not only the biggest festival in Australia, but we've gone from 200,000 to 2.33 million in eight years, and I think that makes us the most successful festival in Australian history, ladies and gentlemen. And why? Because we're goddamn Australian. Vivid is uniquely Australian. It's uniquely Sydney. We came up with it. It has nothing to do with New Year's Eve, or Valentine's Day, or Halloween. We came up with it ourselves. All these people in this room. We came up with an idea to turn around winter in Sydney, which had been particularly disastrous in terms of tourism, etc., etc. And as Sandra said, $183 million in tourist expenditure and 123,000 vivid Sydney packages. What are we doing right? Who knows? Anyway, I won't, I won't keep um, hammering on this. I would just really thank, like to thank uh, Sandra and Julie, Julie Turpey, who has just joined the team. Um, I know she has absolutely no idea what we're doing to her, but she's very cool about it. And I would really, 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 really like to thank people like Adam, um, Adam Lowe, ladies and gentlemen. He's the project director of uh, Vivid Sydney. Kind of means, like, you know, kind of produces it. Um, I gave Adam his first job in 1996, 97, 97. Um, on Sydney New Year's Eve, and now he is running Vivid Sydney. This is what we all need to be doing. We need to be getting our protégés and giving them the opportunity to run the events and keep Australia's event industry going from strength to strength. And We've got the people to do it. Uh, you may have noticed one of them, the gorgeous Indiana Bell. That is really her name, Indiana Bell. Can you believe that? She is as fantastic as her name sounds. Folks, we've got a great responsibility. We do Australia's big public events. We bring people together in public and help them rejoice together. We need to keep the quality there. We need to look at the people we're working with and give them the opportunity. I'll never forget something that the great Sir Thomas Beecham said to one of the members of his orchestra, she was a cellist. He said to her, Madam, you have between your legs an instrument capable of giving joy to thousands. And all you can do is scratch it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Let's stop scratching. Let's keep this industry moving forward and forward and forward. Okay? Thank you so, so much. Long live the Australian event industry. Thank you.